years when I took over the position. And Marvelous Marvis, oh man, I wish I would have known that because I would have called him that and teased him about that. So I wish I would have known that, but we know our elders at a certain point in their life and sometimes they don't tell us what their life led up to. So these memorials are always such an education for the staff from LBFE. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about what the staff um, thought of Marvis and share some stories. And then he was matched with a volunteer who lived in the city. He moved out of, this, out of state during COVID and Larry and Marvis had a weekly phone call on Wednesday night. So I asked Larry to write down a few words. So I wanna share those words with you. Um, Marvis knew about LBFE because of his work in the community. And then in about 19, or maybe 2007, we started um, give, providing services for Loretta. So then he knew about LBFE, and so as he was aging alone, he called us and he got services from us. And LB, at LBFE, Marvis kind of was a social butterfly, as I'm hearing. He um, was up for anything, any new pilot program we would do, any visitor. Um, somebody said he was non-judgmental, and that's what he was. He would accept a volunteer of, of any stripes and color, and he really wanted to have a true conversation with that person. Um, Marvis was somebody who kept us up to date on everything. As most of you know, he was a night owl. So he would leave us messages about at 3.15 a.m. in the morning with that radio voice. He really had a voice for radio. And he would tell us stories, and he would always say, please share with the other elders that a rainstorm is coming, a windstorm is coming. He was so, he really took care of people he never even met through our program. And he always wanted to say, this is when you vote, this is when you can register to vote. And when we saw that in 1935, which were the last four numbers of his phone number, we always knew there was a message from Marvis. Um, we really truly miss hearing that voice on our answering machine. And Marvis didn't take people for granted. He was kind and gentle this, to all the staff and all the volunteers. Anytime we had a new staff member, he would want their emails so they could be included in his mass emails. So he always wanted to have everyone feel welcome at LBFE. We would always chuckle that we were copied on the emails he would send to Nancy Pelosi and the emails he would send to the mayor. I can see some head nodding. So you were also copied on those emails, right? Um, you know, he was so appreciative of his helpers. And that's Jessica and Francisco, who took care. Are you Jessica? Yeah, I, I, would, I would like to share a little bit if I can. Yes, if I can. he was so appreciative of, of all of you. And he didn't take you guys for granted. He always talked to us about you. And um, we provided uh, a ride to his medical appointments and every first of the month so he could go do his banking because he never wanted to be late on his it really was amazing. And Jessica and Francisco always assisted him on those rides. Um, and I know you were there for the final weeks of his life and I'm sure that gave him such peace. So thank you for that, Jessica. Okay, now I think LBFE has to say, we were the ones that taught Marvis how to use the internet and email. He was, a, uh, a pot, he was part of our Tech Allies program where we taught older adults who were suffering from the digital divide how to use a, uh, the internet, how to use a tablet. So those emails, you can thank Debbie, our, volunteer, our Tech Allies coordinator for that. He loved using those emails for community organizing. He jumped into it with both feet. He loved connecting with family and friends on Facebook. He met family he didn't even know existed through Facebook. Um, he was so excited about all aspects of using the tablet. And Marvis, he was like one of our favorite older adults that we served, so we always made sure he had the newest tablet, so he would never be behind. 
Um, Marvis was also matched with two students in an intergenerational program, and he was able to share his community organizing and his dedication to the Tenderloin, and he showed the students that, is it the Alcaraz Theater? Is that how you pronounce it? The theater in the Tenderloin? That Alcatraz. Oh. Alcatraz Theater, okay. And you can tell I'm not from San Francisco. And how he registered a 1,000 people to save that theater. And so here is, I'm gonna just talk a little bit about what Larry wrote in an email. Larry lives in New Mexico and he really, really wanted to be here, but he just actually lost his brother the day after Marvis passed. Mm -hmm. So this is from Larry, he goes, Marvis and I spent many hours talking, and intertwined through our conversation was his passion for serving the community. For example, on a recurring basis, the San Francisco Planning Department solicited his input on submitted building development projects. With a pulse on the goings on in the city, Marvis would eagerly share those details of these plans by reading them to me. And more often than not, from just the physical address, he was able to identify the neighborhood in which the project was taking place, a testament to his knowledge of the city and his love for the city. As we go through this plan, both residential and commercial, he'll call out the flaws and mark them as red flags. Without fail, implementing the California Environmental Quality Act, mm -hmm. process came up with each project, and when it did, Marvis would announce the common occurrence with his signature dry delivery. Well, that's the CEQA for you. Um, CEQA became the Easter egg in our review sessions. With anticipation, we secretly awaited for it to surface, and then when it came, we would giggle and share our thoughts and our laughs. Um, once that tapped, that tapped into Marvis's love, doing what he did was bringing out his dry wit, a characteristic that warranted me more celebration as far as I'm concerned. If these little bits, but oh so very precious moments, we both cherish, and I will continue to cherish them, cherish them in keeping his spirit alive. Finally, I would like to share with you some words that Marvis left us in an interview in February, in September of 2021 um, LVFE did a campaign called Changing Faces of San Francisco where we interviewed older adults. And we asked him the question, what would you say are the major values or the principles that you live by? And Marvis replied, it's important to be truthful and fight like hell when it's the right thing to do. It was crucial I established and nurtured professional relationships with community workers I feel I was destined to be a community worker and a leader. From connecting with the mayor and the police force, I expanded my network to help make a difference in the Tenderloin. So that was Marvis. And there's always the saying that as long as you have someone's memory and you think of them, they, that person is still alive. And I hope that we all can keep Marvis's memory in our thoughts and in our hearts so then we can always know that part of them is alive. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy, for sharing those stories. Um, next up, could you please welcome Ryan Cheeky from, uh, he's uh, the owner of the Future Park. Hello, Father. Good afternoon, everybody. Well, it is a real honor to be here to speak about Marvis, I'm speaking as a business operator in the Tenderloin. Uh, Captain Garrity, is a, even though he ended as Commander Garrity, I'll, I'll always know him as Captain Garrity. And uh, 20 years ago is when I first got to encounter Marvis. Um, and the reason I got to encounter him at that early stage was I was trying to open our first little bar on Geary Street here in the Tenderloin. And I went to Captain Garrity, a fellow Irishman, and I said, you know, some of these neighbors are telling me that they don't want any more bars in the Tenderloin. He said, yeah, there are too many bars and too many reckless saloon keepers. I said, well, I'm not one of those. And he goes, well, you're going to have to go prove it to Marvis and the Nutty Brothers. <laughs> so I made an appointment. Um, I made my presentation at the community meeting. And it was announced by Michael Nutty 
that Marvis was in charge of licensing for the district. And Marvis pulled out his page, and he had about 50 questions on there that I had to answer, and I was very impressed. He had some serious questions. So I wasn't prepared for those questions. I stumbled, I fell over, and I left the room with my tail between my legs. And I think it was about six months later, we got another opportunity to present in front of Marvis as the leader of that committee. And by then, we had done our community outreach. We met with other operators in the district, other business owners, and all of them said the same thing. If you're gonna be in the bar business and the tenderloin, you've gotta respect your neighbors. You have to know who your neighbors are, and you have to know who the local community leaders are. And that's what I learned from Marvis. So when we come back six months later, Dennis Isner was there, Michael and John were there, and Marvis, and we made the presentation, and he didn't have to ask any questions that time because he had prepared us. So years went by, we opened a second business in the tenderloin and a third business in the tenderloin, and by then we had proven that we were not reckless saloon keepers. We were, you know, respectful neighborhood saloon keepers. Um, and we were adding, added, we added something positive to the tenderloin. So Marvis appreciated that, and then in later years, people would go to make their presentation at these various community meetings, and Marvis would have, have a page of questions for them, and just like me, they would stumble if they hadn't prepared. And at the end of their stumble, he would say, you need to go talk to Brian Sheehy at Future Bars. He went through this and he figured it out. So to this day, I get people contacting me asking, how do you prepare to present to Marvis and the Nutty Brothers? I said, well, here's how you do it. So he really taught me as a business operator in the world of saloon keeping, how to be respectful of neighbors, how to not take them for granted, and not be just focused on the four walls of your little business, but you've gotta be a part of the neighborhood. So because of Marvis's ability to have his research done, and him being a protector of the neighborhood, almost like a mini mayor, um, he really helped us to become much more successful business operators, and uh, we've survived through all those years, and. Captain Garrity just told me that he has known Marvis for 40 years, but I've only got to know him for 20 years, but he really made a positive contribution to my life and in general to the entertainment and respectful and non-reckless entertainment in the Tenderloin. So we're gonna miss him. Thank you, guys. page 
put under my office door when I come 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 back to the to the building and I will read it and I will drop by this unit and talk to him for a while. And every year he will buy a Christmas pass to me. And he really, really nice to me. And every year when I have a uh, food back day, I will try to reserve a bag for him and make him feel happy and make him feel like he deserves something from our community. After his wife passed away, he was dealing with family loss. And during that time, I have some conversation and discussion about how to create a support group here, like a grief support group. Well, we did it. And, uh, but not too successful because Chinese culture, they don't want to share about people are passed away, how to share their emotion together. So, but at least we try. Uh, today is really sad day for me to see someone I know for a long time and, and have another stage in his life. But rest in peace, Marcus. Thank you.
really, really devastating. He couldn't tell me what he wanted, what he, what, what he, wanted, what he needed. Um, and then I, I think what was important for me in, in that 